Mariano Rivera became the first player to make 100% of Hall of Fame vote as ballots while Edgar Martinez stormed into the Hall on his 10th and final try, marking the strongest affirmation for baseball specialists in the history of the sport. Roy Halladay and Mike Messina rounded out the four-man class, joining the greatest closer and greatest designated hitter in MLB history and punching their tickets to Cooperstown. Rivera's induction was a stone-cold lock for the Hall from the moment he strode off the mound that final time at Yankee Stadium. The 13-time All-Star holds three all-time MLB records, finishing 952 games, saving 652 of them, and posting a 2.21 era that, adjusted for the high offense era in which he spent his peak years, works out to an astronomical 205 era. Of course, lots of Hall of Fame inductees can reel off jaw-droppingly impressive resumes, yet none of them before Rivera had ever earned a checkmark on every ballot. For that, you can thank the five rings that Rivera earned while wearing the most revered set of pinstripes in sports. No mere passenger on the Yankees' dynasty cruise, Rivera has a postseason record that defies belief, 141 innings pitched, 86 hits, just two, home runs allowed, and a microscopic 0.70 era. Even with all those numbers, all those accolades, all those rings, and all that Yankees mystique, Rivera getting in unanimously is still shocking and puzzling, considering Voda's historic tendencies. You can throw out the early batches of Hall inductees who were considered under an arcane system that made unanimous approval all but impossible. Even after doing that, though, how does a pitcher who spent most of his career pitching one inning at a time, with the bases empty, often protecting multiple run leads, earn recognition that Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Greg Maddox, and Ken Griffey Jr. did not? No general manager in the universe would have ever traded Peak Rivera for Peak Mays or Aaron or Maddox or Griffey, given the latter group's far superior accomplishments. The whole reason most pitchers become relievers is because they don't have the pitch repertoire, the stamina, or simply the raw skill required to neutralize hitters for seven or eight innings at a time, thus confining them to one inning instead. Rivera himself, like Eric Gagne, Jonathan Papelbon and many of his top contemporaries, was a flawed starter in both the high minors and his rookie season in the majors before he became the greatest reliever of all time. That's not to say that Rivera wasn't a phenomenal player, or that he doesn't warrant induction, he was, and he does. It's that elevating Rivera above the Hall's five tool legends and greatest starting pitchers, like inducting Bruce Sutter and Lee Smith but not Bobby Gritch or Lou Whitaker, is to misunderstand how the game of baseball fundamentally works. What we can say is that with a few exceptions, the men and women charged with covering baseball for a living have ditched most of their biases regarding specialists like relief pitchers and designated hitters. Which is why we can now call Edgar Martinez a Hall of Famer too. For nine years, voters overlooked Martinez's candidacy. On a superficial level, you could close your eyes and maybe sorta kinda see why. Martinez amassed just 309 home runs and 2,247 hits in his career, numbers that fall short of the round milestones some voters seek to make their decisions easier. He never won an MVP award and only once finished top 5 in MVP voting. He was often overshadowed by flashier teammates, including Hall of Famers Griffey and Randy Johnson, as well as Alex Rodriguez and Ichiro Suzuki. And yes, he spent most of his career as a DH, piling up 1,403 games at that positionless position. All of those demerits, justified or not, fade into the background when you consider this one, immutable fact. Edgar Martinez effing rate. Stack up every hitter since 1900 with his many plate appearances as he had, and Edgar ranks 20th by park adjusted offense, just ahead of inner circle Hall of Famers Mike Schmidt and Willie McCovey. This fall is a timeless game, one that ends only after enough outs have been recorded, making avoiding outs and getting on base the single most important skill a player can possess. Stack up every hitter since 1900 with his many plate appearances as he had, and Edgar ranks 12th in on-base percentage, just ahead of the great Stan Musial.
go ahead and offer absolutely zero utility or even negative utility in the field. You play more than 2,000 games and hit like that, you're in the hall. Edgar did, and Edgar is. Fellow DH and vastly inferior player Harold Baines getting voted in by the Today's Game Committee only reinforces how readily DHs are now accepted by the sports gatekeepers. And doubly reinforces Martinez's rock-solid worthiness for induction. The third member of this year's class voted in on the regular BBWAA ballot is Halliday. Doc was the best player in the world at his position for multiple seasons, one of the best ways to identify Hall of Famers over merely really, really great players. Beyond mere greatness, Halliday also evolved from a seemingly injury-prone pitcher early in his career to a workhorse, further clinching his case for the Hall. As I wrote in November, the quality that set Halliday apart from his peers during his own era is the same trait that would make him an absolute unicorn if his peak numbers were plopped down into the middle of the 2018 season, he was an absolute hoss, a workhorse of the highest order who threw an obscene number of innings. For all of his league-leading stat columns, the stat in which Halliday led the league more than any other is complete games, doing so a jaw-dropping seven times, including five years in a row. In 2011, Doc went the distance eight times. For some perspective, since that 2011 season, no pitcher has fired more than six complete games in a season. Rounding out this class is the once underrated, now properly rated Orioles and Yankees standout Mike Messina. Unlike Halliday, Messina never held the mantle of greatest pitcher in the game. But it's tough to blame him for coincidentally being born around the same time as Randy Johnson, Pedro Martinez, Greg Maddox and Roger Clemens, collectively making up the greatest class of pitchers ever to peak in the same era. Voters correctly threw out all the specious arguments against Messina and slid him in with 76.7% of the vote. Of players who fell short of induction, keep an eye on four players. First, Barry Bonds, 59.1% of the vote, up from 56.4% last year, and Roger Clemens, 59.5% of the vote, up from 57.3% last year, have decent cases as the best hitter and best pitcher of all time. Yet a big block of voters doesn't care, holding up accusations of pet use over performance while conveniently forgetting that several of baseball's immortals used performance-enhancing drugs themselves. Kurt Schilling, 60.9% of the vote, up from 51.2% last year, did himself no favors with his abhorrent comments about Muslims, transgender people and journalists. But his regular season resume, by the standards of existing Hall of Fame pitchers, is hall-worthy, and that's not even counting Schilling's accomplishments as one of the greatest postseason performers in baseball history. Finally there's Larry Walker, who made a huge jump from 34.1% of the vote last year to 54.6% this year. With one year left on the ballot, the extremely deserving 5-2 outfielder should get a final year boost the way that Tim Raines and other 10th year candidates did. Get ready for 12 months of drum banging for the kid from Maple Ridge, PC. Especially from this extremely unbiased Canadian.